The May jobs report came in way stronger than expected with 272,000 new jobs and wage growth was also hotter than expected. And that's stoking fears that the Federal Reserve will not cut rates at the September meeting. Well, real estate is very affected by jobs, of course, and rates. If people are working and experiencing wage growth, well, they're more likely to buy a home or pay rent. But how do we measure job growth and is it accurate? Well, our guest today is an expert in that. I'm Kathy Fetke. Welcome to The Real Wealth Show. You're listening to The Real Wealth Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. Welcome back to our YouTube channel. If you like what you're hearing, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe below. Your support really helps our rankings and helps us reach more people. So thank you. Our guest today, Jose Torres, spent six years working as an economist in the U.S. government at the FDIC and the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, before taking the position he has currently as senior economist at Interactive Brokers. Jose was also a professor of economics at the City University of New York and holds a master's degree in financial economics from West Texas A&M University. And he's here with us today on The Real Wealth Show. Jose, welcome to The Real Wealth Show. Hi, Kathy. Great to be here. So I got to hear you speak at The Money Show, and it, it's always fun. For some reason, it's really fun for me to listen to economists. So a lot has changed since then. It's only been a few months. But what are you seeing now in the economy that... Is it shifting? Are things finally slowing down the way the Fed wants it to? I think so. You know, we got first quarter economic growth down to uh, around one and a half percent down from three percent in the fourth quarter of last year. Uh, we are seeing interest rates tick higher, however, and that's been sort of weighing on real estate transactions, particularly with residential However, I think that the residential real estate sector at this juncture is actually a lot more rate sensitive than it is cyclical. So to the extent that the economy continues to slow down, in fact, even a recession, I think would actually be good for the residential real estate market. And let me tell you why. Because if, the un if we have the unemployment rate tick up to 5% or 5.5%, that can move mortgage rates, the 30-year fixed, down to around 6% but still keep most of Americans employed. You know, historically, uh, an unemployment rate of 5 to 6% is pretty strong. These days, however, we have, we've had unemployment rates closer to 3%. So if we get some softness, joblessness rate goes to 5 or 6%, that's actually going to be very constructive for re residential real estate because it's going to open up affordability. Right now, the problem isn't jobs. Everyone has jobs. The problem is pricing, rate, and valuation mix. So when you say uh, real estate, I mean, there's so many asset classes in real estate. Uh, obviously, office is getting hit so hard. Uh, but were you speaking specifically to one to four unit homes? Uh, yeah. In this case, I was sp uh, speaking about single family. Okay, single family. Um, now, the unemployment rate is about 4% now. It ticked up ever so slightly, even though there was like tremendous job growth last month that, um, or in May that kind of shocked economists. It just keeps cranking. So can you explain how we could have uh, really robust job growth in May, but also see the employment unemployment rate go up a little bit? Absolutely. So the jobs report is comprised of two distinct information requests. One is issued to establishments, firms, businesses, corporations. The other one is sent to households. Now, the headline jobs growth that we got, 272,000, wage growth, 0.4%. Those figures come from the establishment side. So that's traditionally a spreadsheet that's sent over to the BLS. However, the unemployment rate is actually calculated with responses from households, which are typically not spreadsheets with 16,000 rows. They're just an answer, yes or no. And 
that data tends to be much softer, less harder. Of course, spreadsheets are going to have a much higher degree of accuracy than random folks picking up the phone or opening the door when a government employee knocks. <laughs> and <laughs> so, so why, why, why is the hard data more accurate, right? Because sometimes we're not in a good mood. So if we pick up the phone and we're not in a good mood and we maybe perhaps we woke up on the wrong side of the bed, then maybe we tell the government we want to represent a better version of ourselves in the sample size or in some cases, a worse version of ourselves in the sample size. In some cases, some folks are concerned about immigration status, right? Because the BLS doesn't, well, is going to pretty much call and contact randomly sampled households. So if someone is afraid of their immigration status, they may not respond accurately. Uh, and, and those are some of the differ, diff, differences between the hard and the soft data. Again, establishment survey and household survey. Establishment has the job growth and the wages. The establishment survey has the unemployment rate, labor force participation, as well as the rate of labor force participation, which, by the way, ticked down 20 basis points. A quarter of a million people, 250,000, decided that they were going to stop looking for work and they're and they're not working at the moment. They're so they're not working. They're currently unemployed, but they're also so discouraged that they they stopped looking for work. Wow. Well, why why would that be if if there's seven million job openings? <laughs> so so um, before we go to the job openings, um, I just want to fin finish finish the thought. Yeah, I just finish, want to finish the, the thought, thought because here. as you speak, I'm thinking we are in 2024. We have AI breaking loose. All of this sounds super outdated, like the 60s or something, the way we're collecting this data. <laughs> That's true. So, so real quick on the unemployment rate. So uh, the, there's a numerator and there's a denominator, right? The numerator, the numerator is the number of people that are unemployed and the denominator is the labor force. So what I just told you, 250,000 people leaving the labor force saying, I don't want to work, I don't want to look for work that actually weighs, it puts upward pressure on the unemployment rate because now the denominator is lessened. To your question on job openings now. So we have tons of job openings. And you know, Kathy, we've had a ton of job, job openings for a long time. When I was at the Bureau of Labor Statistics back in 2018, uh, at the time, we were focused on the skills mismatch we believed, and that ca the case is still true today, that the skills that American workers have are not aligning with the qualifications that companies desire, right? So companies may want a lot of tech workers, a lot of math heavy workers, a lot of medical folks. The economy right now doesn't have that many. So that's leading to a structurally higher job number of job openings. Uh, so, so, you know, we could have a situation where unemployment rate ticks up and yeah, we have a lofty level of vacancies, but the people out there in the labor pool don't have the adequate preparation to fill those roles. Interesting. Okay. And, and your comment on like this data, this way of collecting data, how long has it been this way and is it outdated when we're, when we're living a technology world? You know, it's been like this for quite some time. <laughs> <laughs> now, I will say that uh, the BLS has, you know, they're using email, they're, they're using, you know, some of the more um, sophisticated tools. But to your point, it is still quite, uh, you know, it's not Silicon Valley, um, you know, standard, if you will, you know, they're still kind of outdated. Part of it is the budget, Kathy, you know, uh, they, they, the, the budget for them is really not, hasn't been uh, firmed up. Also, another development over there, Kathy, is that the response rates, folk, these surveys, consumer price index, jobs growth, producer price index, all these surveys are voluntary. If we get letters in the mail from the government, asking us to participate in these surveys, we don't actually have to. And after the pandemic, 
those numbers have dropped precipitously in terms of response rates, participation rates. Out of every 100 people that get sent to request, how many people are answering? If less people answer, we have reduced data quality because now BLS economists have to estimate the percentage of the sample that didn't respond. Wow. You know, here so many people rely on this data, including our own Federal Reserve that is uh, tasked with managing the numbers and the data to make big decisions. But we'll move on. <laughs> There's nothing, no, no, no way we can solve it. It's just what it is. And uh, we have to work with the data, even if it's skewed. It's just surprising that with supposedly 7 million job openings, that there would be 250,000 people saying, I give up, I can't find a job. So is that is it because, like you said, it's a mismatch? They The jobs that are there are not the ones that they can do or want to do? You know, I, that, that that's definitely a factor. But now let's shift a little bit to another thing that I think is um, discouraging workers. And really, it's the elevated prices that we have in today's economy, the lofty interest rates and the reduced credit availability, the American dream appears to be escaping our fingertips, particularly if you're a millennial. Mm -hmm. uh, the percentage of income on, on average required to service a mortgage is, you know, out in the nosebleeds, you know, really high levels. And, you know, we're seeing also decline in birth rates. Uh, we're seeing structural changes in family, work, life, and you know that's that's leading to, you know, shifts about how people feel about work and and, and those kinds of things. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I don't actually know how families make it happen. If you're not making enough money at your job and you have children, there's really just no point in working because the cost of childcare is so expensive. I talk to a lot of young people and. It gets like two to three thousand dollars a month per kid. You know how are you gonna? How you have to make a lot of money just to send the kids to to daycare. So I, I really I know it's a tough time for young people right now. Um, would you? I have often said the problem is this easy money printing that devalues the dollar and creates inflation. Am I oversimplifying what's causing this this problem? No, I, I mean, we can certainly go into the abyss and talk about all the dynamics, but absolutely, that's definitely what's, what's going on. We just had these easy money policies. We've had rates in the basement for so long. Uh, that's propped up the price of assets where if you're already in, it's terrific. But if you're not in, your path is becoming more and more narrow. And I'm afraid that... Um, you know, the, the, the American dream and Amer uh, U.S. economic growth over the decades has really been powered a lot of times by folks that have had a need, that have had desire to climb and move up into higher levels of social mobility and to uh, the middle and upper classes. And, you know, that path is becoming more narrow. And that coincides with, you know, younger folks saying, I don't want to work anymore. Yeah, so I, I just really want our audience to hear this because I just, you know, I heard my daughter actually saying it recently, blaming other things, corporations and, uh, you know, for not paying their fair share of taxes and so forth. And um, that may or may not be the case, but the real uh, culprit here in this massive uh, divide between the wealthy, those who have and those who are struggling uh, is the devaluation of the dollar. You, if you keep printing more money, if you keep bringing in more boxes of, of fake money to the monopoly game, but you have the same number of little apartments and houses on the board, you know, it's going to take more, if there's more competition, more people who want these things, it drives prices up. So don't, don't blame anyone, but our government and the federal reserve for wanting to, you know, continually create more money. Uh, with that said, you mentioned earlier that if the unemployment rate does get up to 5%, that could eventually be good for housing. Uh, but what about you know the people? What would be the impact of a 5% unemployment rate? And is that what the Fed seems to be targeting? Because I thought, I thought four or four and a half is what they wanted. You know, it really, it's a mix between the unemployment rate and inflation. 
And we have the unemployment rate at 4%, but inflation is still around. It's still sticky. We're going to get a CPI report uh, tomorrow, which is going to be soft, but it won't be soft because of the labor market wages cooling or because of rents cooling or because of home prices uh, going sideways. No, those things are continuing to move higher. What, the reason why tomorrow's CPI report, we are... Um, uh, recording here on June 11th, tomorrow's June 12th. The reason that tomorrow's CPI report is going to come in relatively cool, either 0.1% or 0.2% month over month, is because of gasoline prices due to simmering geopolitical tensions. Look at the labor market. Wages are still growing because there's only you know, labor is scarce. There's only a, a few folks that that are dependable, that you know you can hire, uh, that can get the job done well. So that's keeping employee compensation costs sticky. Uh, rents are remaining strong. You know, with rents, new rents are going down, right? They're, they've been weakening slightly for some time, but people don't move every year, right? So that takes a while to start to work its way in. New home market also it's been weakening. We're seeing prices coming down. The builders are looking to discount and offer rate concessions to move the products. Same thing there, though. That comprises a small share of the market. We look at existing homes, right? Those prices are all at all-time highs. And you look at existing rents or lease renewals. Right? No one's getting a discount on a lease renewal. Folks that are staying, they're getting their costs bumped up, right? Landlords are contending with higher interest costs, loftier charges for maintenance, insurance, labor, among other things, taxes as well. So, you know, landlords are not in a position where if someone wants to renew a lease, you know, the vacancy rate in multifamily is not that high where they're going to start giving lease discounts on a month over month basis. So when you take those four segments together, the weaker ones are new homes and new rents, existing homes and lease renewals remain very, very strong and not enough for the former two, which comprise roughly 25 to 33 percent of the, the total market to really soften the inflationary outlook. So I think what you're saying is we're not going to see inflation come down for a bit to where the Fed wants it. I don't think so, Kathy. I think that global central banks are kind of accepting inflation between 3 and 4% uh, due to the mistakes that you alluded to earlier. And that's great for asset prices, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't put the pressure on inflation to the downside, that's great for real estate prices. That's great for stock prices, which are hovering near all-time highs at the moment, right? Going pushing towards that last mile and really trying to get down to the two handle on inflation, that's what's going to pressure corporates and uh, investors, and and you know and and get give us an economic slowdown, and then eventually bring the long end of the yield curve lower, which is going to help real estate investors and operators a good deal. Oh, I can't, I can't emphasize enough the importance of doing whatever it takes to get into assets. I mean, that's what I'm hearing you say. If you don't own assets, you're going to be swimming after the boat that is sailing with a, it's a party boat. You know, it's a party boat. People with assets are on it. Those who are trying to get on that boat are going to have to work hard, um, harder than probably ever. But once you get on that boat, it, life will get easier because you'll be uh, your assets will inflate with inflation. Yeah, this inflation problem isn't going to go away. And I don't know how the Fed is going to ever get off the drug, right? How how can they not continue to print money to pay for the debt that we already have uh, and then therefore create more inflation? I mean, there's really kind of no other way out. The Fed could deflate, you know, and that would not be great. That would lead to recession or they just continue to inflate, right? Are those the two choices? Uh, generally speaking, yes. You know, you either you, I mean, right now, I don't think they're being too accommodative, but to your point, they're not being restrictive enough to bring inflation down to 2%. 
And to the extent that we remain in that middle ground where, okay, we're not going to accommodate too much, but we're not going to restrict excessively either, then you just, you're just you just stuck with inflation at 3.5%, which compounds, to your point of assets, which compounds really strongly. You know, 3.5%, if you accept that over three years, it's not 3.5 times, you know, times three. It compounds, it builds on itself year after year after year. So when you compare 3.5% inflation over three years versus 2% inflation over three years, it's a huge difference, particularly for lower class and middle class families. Wow. Okay. So uh, real estate, do you, th- do you believe, uh, we've just seen for the last couple of years, uh, there was talk about a housing crash if, if uh, rates went up. Um, the opposite has happened. Prices have gone up. Uh, do you think we'll get to a point where supply will meet demand and we'll start to see prices stabilize or even come down? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think that the, the supply shortage is is just too great to lead to an environment of falling prices. Initially, I thought so in 2022. But the ferociousness of the capital markets, namely stocks, have really created a strong wealth effect amongst amongst homeowners who a lot of them have 401ks. In fact, most of them do, where they're in no rush to liquidate if they need to, right? So most folks that have existing properties, they're not in no rush, especially considering the fact that a lot of them have locked in at three or three and a half. So literally by selling the property there right now to maybe upgrade to something better, or even if they downsize, you know, if they go out at a a certain price, let's call it half a million dollars and buy something else at the same price. When you consider the, the uh, difference in mortgage costs from roughly three and a half, let's say to, 7% 7% today or 6.8% today, we're talking about thousands of dollars more in debt servicing costs. And that's just kept the owners kind of just sitting back waiting uh, and price negotiations between sellers and prospective buyers are just really wide because the buyers are saying, well, I can't afford it. And the sellers are saying, well, look at inflation. Everything is going higher. Well, hopefully mortgage rates come down to unlock that market because I agree I'm I'm in no rush to sell and go buy half a house for twice the payment. Yeah, no one wants to do that unless you're forced to. All right, any last thoughts, Jose, on on real estate? I know you're you're in real estate, right? Or you work? Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, well, no, I I, uh, I do cover real estate as an economist, and we uh, here at Interactive Brokers we offer a diverse set of REITs. For um, folks to you know buy, sell, uh, do all kinds of transactions with, um, I do think that the residential market, single family, is good for investors at the moment. I also think multifamily is a solid proposition because I think rent growth stays positive. Now, yeah. the more commercial sectors, namely office, I'm really worried about, but the other ones like hotels and warehouses and retail seem like they're doing just fine. So I think overall, real, re, real estate is a good spot to be in. So you're not worried about uh, a recession or a crash? You think we might get a, a soft landing? A recession is good for the real estate market because okay. it's going gonna, it's gonna to drive the unemployment rate higher. It's going to improve affordability. And we are not going to have a recession where the unemployment rate ticks up to 10% like we see in the movies where, oh, look, all these folks are looking for work. We're not going to have that kind of recession. Corporate balance sheets are too strong. There's too many job openings. Folks that want to work are going to have avail- uh, going to have job availability. And that's going to make it where they can service mortgage payments a lot better if rates come down to six or the high fives. Okay, so don't fear the headlines that say we might have a recession. It would be good. It, it would p- potentially make things more affordable because you're right. The Fed would then lower rates and... Uh, mortgage mortgages would uh, follow suit. All right, Jose, it's such a pleasure to have you here on The Real Wealth Show. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me here. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone.
And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. If you'd like to find out more about the areas that are growing quickly with job and population growth and where there's a shortage of housing and how we as investors can help with the solution by providing more housing through new builds or buying older homes and fixing them up to rent-ready condition, you can go to realwellshow.com. It's free to join and you'll be able to speak with one of our investment counselors and they can refer you to builders or property managers and other teams to help you build your real estate portfolio nationwide. I'm Kathy Fetke. Thanks for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. We'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.